this is a fun Friday for me. I can't believe I get to spend an hour with the legend herself, Kathy Jamison. How are you doing, Kathy? I am doing just great. And how about you? I'm doing great. My uh, my son that helps me, he was a senior in uh, college, and they told him he could finish his senior year online, so he moved back home to help his old man out with his podcasting stuff, and uh, it's just uh, it's just a blast doing these with my son. Isn't that great? great? And I should be calling you Dr. Kathy Jamison. Congratulations on your PhD you got back in 2010. That, that was amazing. What, what made you set out to, to do that? I think I am just a committed forever student. I really love the learning process. I'm a teacher. My, my bachelor's degree is actually education, so I love teaching. I love learning. And I really feel like I owe to my clients and to the audiences and to the industry to be on the cutting edge. And if I'm going to profess to be a management expert, then I wanted to do as much as I could, learn as much as I could about the, the background of management, the theories, the principles, as well as the most recent research in management, what works, what doesn't work, what's proven, what's not proven, and then to fold that into a management strategy for dentistry that works and works well. While we always believe we've done that, I just wanted the uh, continued education personally and professionally as well. It was great. Well, I, I couldn't even count all of my personal friends who have used your consulting service over the years, and I'm from Kansas, you're from Oklahoma. I always thought those those Midwestern people, they're, they're always more about keeping it real as opposed to some fancy highfalutin theory that they learn in some of these coastal big cities. And um, America's the heartland, and you're, you've been keeping it real in the heartland forever. I, I want to ask you this. You come out of dental school. Um, you open up a practice. Is a leader just born, or can you learn to be a leader? I mean, is it something you can educate a kid to be a leader? Because I think it's the hardest skill you ever learn. Learn. It's not doing a root canal. It's not placing an implant. It's how to be a leader. And and how much of that is just natural born uh, leader, and how much of that can they um, train themselves and educate themselves so that they can lead lead their team? It's a very good question. Leaders are not born. Uh, we all have a different personality style. Some of the greatest leaders in the world have, have had vastly different personalities and vastly different backgrounds. So leaders are not born. These are skills, and therefore because they're skills, they can be learned. Are there some attitudes that are beneficial to becoming a great leader? Absolutely. You have to want to. You have to see the value of it and understand that while it's not necessarily a didactic skill, like, as you say, doing a root canal, these are skills that can be learned. The truth of the matter is, Howard, if you ask all the consultants that have ever worked with us at Jameson Management, and certainly that includes myself and John, my husband John, that if we were going to say, what the ultimate difference in whether or not a doctor has a successful experience in his or her practice or in a consultation experience, it's their ability to lead, to lead themselves, to lead their team. And then in my opinion, really we are leaders of our patients. You can't, nor would you want, to push a patient into making a decision about their treatment, but we can lead them into making decisions that are good for them and hopefully that's a decision to go ahead. So these are skills to be learned. Certainly a lot of people learn their leadership skills from modeling. Modeling is perhaps the best way. If you ask most people, and I love to ask this question, thinking back over your lifetime, think of someone in your life that you considered a great leader in your own life. What did they do? How did they impact you? How did you interact with them? What were their characteristics like? What was their integrity like? Then if you ask them the flip side of that question, okay, think about somebody in your life who maybe wasn't a good leader, who had a negative impact on you or on your work. What did they do? How did that impact you? What were their behaviors? Most people can pull those out very quickly. Oftentimes it's a teacher, a parent, a grandparent, uh, an instructor, a coach, uh, someone that really impacted them. It was somebody who believed in them, someone who cared about them. Someone who probably pushed them because that, that person saw strength or talent or ability and they pushed them a little bit or maybe a lot. It was interesting, uh, the Australian Open is going on right now and, and, so, and so I was listening to an interview with Sharapova and she had lost to Serena and her immediate re reaction or, or conversation in the interview immediately following the match was, 
I learned so much. I can't wait to get with my coach and find ways I can do better. Here's the second best female tennis player in the world. And her immediate reaction after her loss was, it's time to go back to the table and learn how to do what I'm doing even better. That kind of an attitude makes all the difference in the world. Kathy, everyone I know that um, talks about you and has used you, I mean, um, they, they've used you for management, they use you for, you're known phone for marketing, you're known as a legend and building up the hygiene department. But, but I want to start with management because when I'm reading the boards on Dental Town or I'm talking to any dentist and I say, what, 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 what keeps you up at night? What, what, what's your biggest problem? If you could solve one thing, what would it be? It's always the staff. It's always, always the staff. They, they never say what sealer are you using. They never say, hey, do you use direct mail or are you on Facebook? They, they, they always, if, if, if something makes them nauseous and they just want to throw up or quit, it's always staff. What advice would you give my homies listening to this to where they can lead their staff or deal more functionally with their staff and not get so worked up and sick and nauseous and uh, some of these dentists, when they have to fire staff, they, they almost want to quit. They don't even want to go in there to fire them. I mean, it, it's horrible for so many people. What, what advice would you give them? Well, first of all, number one, of course, you're right on the money with that. In fact, I, I did a survey of 3,000 dental professionals, all aspects of dentistry, but uh, all states. And the number one source of stress, just to validate just exactly what you just said, the number one source of stress, I was doing a survey and a research project on stress in dentistry. And the number one source of stress was, was team issues, conflict among team members, not having team members who are performing well, um, losing a good team member. It, yeah, you're right. It wasn't the dentistry. It wasn't the patients. Uh, sometimes their business systems are not functioning well, and that can cause them a lot of stress, but it's team. So the first thing is that, in my opinion, the first thing doctors have to decide is what do I want in my practice? and get that vision in their own mind's eye. And they may need to look at mentors like you or, or me or many others to, to even uh, develop an idea of what they want in their practice. And hopefully, if they want a team of professionals, they're going to work cohesively together and be on the same wavelength as the dentist and be on that same path. Uh, my definition, in fact, of a great dental team is it's a group of leaders working cohesively toward a common set of goals. And I, you, you break that one sentence down. I think everybody on the team is a leader, not just a dentist. So I want people on my team that are leaders that, are, that buy into the vision of our practice, that live and walk and talk our, our mission, our purpose. What are we doing? What are we doing here? And why? And, and that are entrepreneurial enough themselves that they, that they want to get better. I don't want any eight to fivers. And so, and I don't want somebody who constantly blames another person for something that doesn't go wrong. Blame in the workplace is toxic. So the first thing I think a dentist needs to do is just figure out what he or she wants to do. Figure out, and maybe again, as I said, get some mentoring about what can a good team look like. They need to learn how to hire. And here's another huge missing element in almost every practice. The you know, operative word there is almost, but... Most doctors will hire someone because they happen to have been in dentistry a long time. That doesn't necessarily mean this is a great person who brings to the table what they want. So I want a dentist to identify what's the job position. What does this person need to do? If I were looking at the ideal, how this person would perform, what's that look like? What are the end results I want? What kind of personality? What kind of characteristics? And then I'm going to look for that. I'd rather something hire slow and higher right. Then this, what I started to allude to is one of the weakest areas in most practices is the training protocol. So people just throw somebody into the fire and say, hey, good luck, figure it out, hey. The systems may not necessarily be working well anyway and they throw somebody in and either the person doesn't have the wherewithal to clean up the systems or they don't know how the systems are working and so they just do what they know to do. And Chaos leads to more chaos. So I said, let's say the training and what, what I call the orientation period for a, a team member and their integration into the practice is usually very weak. If doctors will spend the time, money, energy, and effort to really hire, write, and integrate a person correctly and do an ongoing, forever um, evaluation of that person's progress and their development, then they're going to probably have a pretty good team. 
the, the study of communication skills is also a huge ongoing part of anybody's life. There's ne never a day any of us, and I include myself, will ever know enough about communication. If relationships break down, it's often from misunderstandings. So keeping those lines of communication open and having regular evaluations. Uh, I have a lot of doctors will say to me, oh, Kathy, I don't do, I don't give feedback. My team members don't need feedback. If I don't tell her she's not doing a good job, then she should just know she's doing a good, she is doing a good job. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. The truth of the matter is no reinforcement is connoted by a human being as negative reinforcement. So people do need to know if they're on the path. They do need to know if they're doing a good job. And they want to know, most people want to know, if they're not performing as well as they could and then be given a chance to do even better. And not everybody, but most people do. So I would say those are some of the criteria, the hiring, the integration and orientation, and then the ongoing feedback. And one of the things that the, that the knowledge worker, Peter Drucker calls people in the workplace today, knowledge workers, and he says, the knowledge worker of today wants continuous education. So I, I'd be a question I would ask in an interview. Does it interest you to continue your education, to have an opportunity to learn more, to go to courses, to have in-office courses, to study together, to get better? And you know, a lot of people know how to interview, and the answer to that is probably going to be yes. But I want to ask that. I want to know if someone has an interest in being better tomorrow than they are today. So. I'm, I'm going to ask you the longest, weirdest question, and I, I since you're a PhD in this, hopefully you figure out my question, but <laughs> so I see all these posts on Dental Town, and um, it starts out with uh, some of the uh, younger girls will say, well, um, staff reacts differently to me because I'm a woman versus uh, I bought my practice from Charlie, and if Charlie said do this, they would. I bought the practice. I say this, and they don't, but I don't, I don't see it as a male female thing because I have 53 year old classmates from UMKC like Stephanie Caramata who's an excellent operator she has none of these issues and I almost think it's not a boy girl I think it's the difference between I mean we, we have dentists from right now practicing that are from the greatest generation the baby boomers the generation X and the millennials I sometimes think that that our generation had more defined lines between boss employee and I see them kind of blurring the lines. They go to happy hour and they get drunk. They post pictures on Facebook that that you just wouldn't have done with your team. Um, can, so my question is this. I can't answer because I'm, I'm a man, you're a woman. Do women have different leadership issues when they're leading an all-female staff versus a man leading an all-female all staff? And the follow-up question is, do you see different leadership styles between the greatest generation, the baby boomers, the generation X, the millennials. Do you think the younger kids are creating some of their problems by their leadership style that their their dad wouldn't have done? Is that enough questions for one question? How many question marks did I get in there, 28? You know what, it's great because you hit so many of the current and I would say relevant issues. So let me address the male, female. Howard, I do believe there are some differences between the female dentist and the whether it's an all-female staff or not I do think there are some differences between the male and the female dentist in how they're how they are functioning as a leader owner owner doctor leader not better or worse let me make that point not better or worse just some differences now that's kind of going into it there there are oftentimes we'll see at the outset, say the early period of someone either buying a practice and coming in to a practice where perhaps a male doctor has owned owned the practice and now a female owns it, or someone coming out and starting a practice which doesn't happen very often. Um, but if they handle that the, handle this correctly or what, handle it well, there is, is ends up being no difference. So the different so here's what has to happen is that there is. I want uh, these open lines of communication, or we could call them open channels of communication. I want those established between any dentist and his or her team. But it's, I think it's imperative that the female dentist, not necessarily, this would be true of the male dentist too, not necessarily, I'm going to use the word wallow, wallow in a lot of the issues that are non-practice related. Now, I'm not saying don't be friends with your, with your team. 
my husband John was very good friends with his team. He loved these people, took care of them, nurtured them. They're still, he isn't practicing anymore, but they're still in his life. So these were these people were friends, but there was still a line of, um, I'm going to call it a line of demarcation. He was the owner. He was the owner. He was the dentist. He wanted to include them in decisions. There was open discussions. We cared about what people thought, but ultimately, he was the bottom line, and that was very clear. Um, I want uh, this sounds this sounds like a silly thing, but I want my female dentist to dress differently than their than their clinical team. I don't want the female dentist coming to work in the same scrubs as the rest of the team. She's a dentist. I want her to be dressed like a dentist. I want her to look like a dentist. I want her to behave like a doctor. And I don't. And I think there needs to be a a line of separation. So when there is discussions, the female dentist needs to be very clear on the parameters with within which behaviors exist in her practice. What is acceptable? What isn't? Very clear as a leader about these are the systems we're going to be using, and this is why. And let that team see her stand behind those systems. Even if somebody comes in and says, oh, I think we could do it a different way, or this doesn't seem to be working, or uh, I used to do it this way, it seems to be better. If this is what she wants to do and believes this is what she needs to do, she needs to stand firm on that and not um, be overridden necessarily. So I'm not saying not inclusive, but I'm saying don't be overridden. So I think there are some differences. Now, everything that I just said would be applicable to a male also. So there's very... There's very little differences. Some of the very best practices we work with, that have some of the very best leaders are, are female. You know, we don't we don't see a lot of differences anymore. Not so much as what perhaps we used to. Now, in terms of the generations, I, I did quite a bit of study on the generational differences when I was doing my research because it's here, and I, and I do think there is a difference in the generations. I would not say better or worse. I'm just going to say difference. I'm a baby boomer. You know, my father was a traditionalist. He's the greatest generation, you know, World War II veteran, so I, I, a Marine. So I, I grew up with that. So there are such, um, there were very stringent, but I would also say healthy, lines of, demarcation, lines of demarcation for behaviors, what was acceptable, what wasn't, and integrity ruled all things. So as the generations have altered, we've seen differences. There was, there was and in some cases still tends to be, uh, a desire on the part of the younger dentists to be more friendly. As you said, go out and get drunk with people, party with people. Be, just be not come across as a leader, but as a pal. And um, so again, it's a fine line to walk, but the the it's hard for the pal who's gone out the night before and been drunk with them to come in today and say that is an unacceptable impression. Let's do this again. You didn't give me the right materials. Whatever. It's hard to walk those two paths. So then you know we all hear about the. Um, the difference in work, work ethic of the current generations versus historical. The research says, I'm not sure I agree with this necessarily, but the research says, I'd be interested in your take on this, the research says pretty dogmatically that it's not a difference in work ethic, it's a difference in work style. That the younger generations don't want to work as much, they saw their parents working really, really hard, uh, earning money, paying for the kids' college, doing all the things they needed to do to get to the point, point that they can, could retire, and then by then they're worn out and all that stuff. And so they want to make a lot of money now. Uh, I, was, I was just visiting with a, one of our um, established doctors who's just hired an associate, and that associate's going to make more money in, a, in his first year out of school than I will ever make in my lifetime. And it doesn't seem to be enough. I'm going like, are you kidding me? Do some research. Look at what the average dentist in America is making. You know, a, but they want to make a lot of money, and they want to make it quickly, and without putting in necessarily any extra hours to do that. I'm not being critical about that. That's just an observation. So what the data shows, and again, I'm not sure I have a sense of this quite yet, is that a difference of work ethic or is it a difference of work style? I have, I have a tendency to believe it's a work style. I, don't, I see ethics, good ethics in the young doctors. I don't see a lack of ethics there. 
um, would I like to see a little bit more commitment to high quality versus rapid dentistry, high quality dentistry instead of rapid dentistry? I would. So anyway, I don't know if I answered that question, Howard, as fully as you'd like me to or if I left out part of it. Well, I, I, I think it's true. I, I don't think I've ever met a young dentist working for his dad that hasn't told me I never want to work as hard as my old man. I mean, they and I mean, look, look at the birth rates. If you take United States, Japan, and all of Europe and back out immigration, their populations are shrinking. I mean, you need 2.3 kids just to keep the herd stable, and you back out immigration, they're all under 2.3. Japan's under one. It's at 0.9. If Europe didn't have immigrants, if the United States didn't have immigrants, we, we'd have a contracting population. They want to have less kids. They don't want to work as hard as their mom. I mean, look at my mom. She she had seven kids in three days. I mean, how, how, how many women do you know that want to get married to a Catholic guy and have seven kids in three days? I mean, they, they uh, a quarter of them don't want any kids. They want less kids. They're having them a decade later. And they just they look at their dad all day, every day, till they drop dead of a heart attack. So I, so I would just say they're just farmer well-rounded and balanced and don't want to I work. So too. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with pe that, that people wanting balance earlier in their lives and enjoying their youth perhaps and taking advantage of yeah, making a good living and being able to spend time with their families or their, or their significant other or travel more, whatever it may be. I don't think there's a problem with that either. either. Um, in fact, I think it's a healthy evolution that everybody talks about balance in life, but I think the younger generations are saying, we're not just going to talk about it, we're going to do it. And so there's some kinds of demands, and I'm going to use the word demands, that they're asking of either doctors they're going in with or expectations of themselves when they go into a practice or buy a practice, whatever it may be, that are different than, say, the baby boomer generation. But I'm not, I'm not sure that's a bad thing. And again, I don't really see a difference in the ethics as much as the style. I want to switch gears completely now from management to uh, hygiene because um, I, I, I'm going to start with this. Um, I know, I mean, you told me 25 years ago, and I was listening to you lecture in Destin, Florida, um, and I don't know if it's, um, and I've heard you several times, but um, a lot of dentists just look at their hygiene department and say, I, I don't care if it makes money or loses money because I don't want to do the cleanings. I'm over here doing crowns and root canals and fillings and pulling teeth and all that kind of stuff. Is hygiene just a loss leader or uh, so that you can be free to do um, high, you know, expensive dentistry? Is hygiene just a loss leader or do you think the hygiene department can and always should make a profit on its own? It's a great question. I, I truly believe that the, the hygiene department is the lifeblood of a dental practice. Therefore, I want it to be a profit center. Now, there is no question what you just described is critical, meaning that I don't want the dentist doing the hygienic appointments. Maybe when a doctor's first out and building a practice, sure, there's a point where that may be appropriate. But I want the dentist having a free schedule so that when dentist restorative or aesthetics or whatever it may be is available to him or her, uh, I want that person to be able to be put in that schedule. So I don't want this, I don't want the doctor's schedule blocked up with hygiene. So here's a rule of thumb. We want the productivity that's coming out of the hygiene department to be approximately 33% of the total production of the practice. So if it's a million dollar practice, I want $333,000 approximately coming out of hygiene. That's all procedures that are produced in the hygiene area. We'd, we'd like for about 50 to 60% of the hygienic procedures to be periodontal in nature. We're, if, if, if it's true, the American Academy of Periodontology and the American Dental Association tells us that approximately 80% of American adults are in some stage of periodontitis, okay, then what are we doing maintaining people in a state of disease? We need to have an active, healthy, proven, stable periodontal program. Then the other thing that happens is that doctors really think that most of their patients are actively involved in hygiene, and the fact of the matter is it's not true. We analyze every practice before we uh, even ask a doctor to consider having us consult with them. So we have data from almost 3,000 practices now. Well, a doctor will say, oh, 70% of my patients are actively involved in hygiene. Well, when we analyze that, and we're going we're gonna to follow the ADA mandates, and I just, in fact, reread this last night, that the ADA does say, and we agree with this, that it's acceptable to allow two years of patients in the active files, to remain in the active files, if those people have been in for treatment in the last two years. 
anything past two years, if you've made conscientious effort to contact them, let's not kid ourselves, that's an inactive patient. Doesn't might mean they might not come back someday, but they're not active. So we want a practice to set a goal of 85 to 90% of the active patient family actively involved in hygiene. Well, the truth of the matter is, across the board in the country, it's about 40%. Some practices will do 50, 60, but it's about 40%. So when practices could realize that by nurturing that which they already have, and that's their existing patient family, they could build a hygiene department that is exponentially bigger and better than what they have now. That's both through activation of patients, reactivation of patients, and or non-surgical perio. Now here's another factor that to me was true in our own practice, it's true in all practices. About 40 to 60 percent of a doctor's restorative or aesthetic dentistry should come right out of hygiene. We track this every day. We tracked how much dentistry we scheduled into John's schedule from our hygienists. And it was thousands, three to five thousand dollars a day, a day out of, from hygiene. Now, of course, he had done the diagnosis, and here we will here. This is a question I think every dentist should ask him or herself. And I want them to ask their hygienist this question and then listen. So ask a hygienist, okay, how many patients do you see on, on the average in a day? Most general practices, they're going to say eight. Sometimes you're going to see more if it's assisted hygiene or whatever. But most of them see, let's say, on the average eight. So now here's the five questions to ask a hygienist. How many of those eight patients either have dentistry diagnosed, but it's not finished yet? That doesn't mean that we don't think they might finish it someday, but when they walk out of your treatment room on Monday, it's not finished. And I hopefully we all agree that if the doctor diagnosed it and treatment planned it, then that patient either needs it or wants it, or it wouldn't be in that in that chart, patient's record. So how are there patients that have dentistry diagnosed but incomplete? The second question is, do they have new issues, new areas of concern? Since their last appointment, has something happened? Did they crack a tooth? Did they lose a filling? Is there open margins that they didn't have before? Whatever it may be. Are there new concerns since the last appointment that need to be addressed? The third question is, does this person have periodontal concerns that either need to be continued or need to be addressed? And the vast majority of those people, the answer is going to be yes. The fourth question is, could some of those eight people coming through your practice, through your room on Monday, could they benefit from some kind of advanced aesthetic dentistry, implants, uh, crowns, bridges, inlays, onlays, a new CIRAC, whatever it may be? That's a pretty good question. And the fifth question is, could, could how many of these eight people could benefit from some kind of an aesthetic alteration? Well. If you ask most hygienists, the answer will be anywhere from, oh, about half of them, but most of them will say, well, if you ask those five questions, all of them. I said, okay, great. So that's eight patients a day. How many days a week are you working? Okay. Then how many weeks in the month? How many months in the year? Look at how much dentistry could be coming right out of hygiene. So, um, you know, I, I, your question is a very good question. It's a very relevant question. If a doctor really sees the depth and the potential of hygiene, I think he or she will, will agree. It's the lifeblood of a dental practice. I, true story. I was lifting weights this morning at Lifetime with my hygienist, uh, Chris Hicks, and I asked her if she thought I should wipe my teeth, and she said I should lose 50 pounds, get a tan, and wear a wig. So uh, <laughs> that was that was her answer to a statement. So, um back back let's th let's stay on hygiene do you like paying them hourly do you like a bonus system um it, does pay influence the hygiene department in your professional opinion you know that's been a, that's been a controversial question throughout time and I, yes i think i just should be paid an hour hourly uh hourly wage you know, hourly is the fairest of all ways to pay actually according to all hr people or most hr people um i love bonus i love for people to feel like they have the lid taken off their salary Salary. That if they if they do better, if the practice does better, if patients do better, that there's not a lid on their salary, and that if the practice is better, so can they. However, I am not a fan of bonus programs that incent incentivize one person and not the rest. 
And so what I mean, I really like a team bonus program, a team bonus program whereby if the hygiene department does better, that means the whole productivity and therefore collections of the practice are, is better, that not only does the hygienist make more, but so does the business staff, so the clinical team, so does the doctor. Because, you know, if it worked for me making a financial arrangement or scheduling the appointment or confirming the appointment or filling the void or answering questions that the patient might not have asked the hygienist, that patient might not schedule. So I really think that everyone has a role in helping people move ahead with treatment. I think everyone has a role in keeping those people in the schedule. So I'm really a big fan of bonus programs. It has to be very carefully aligned. It has to be very carefully set up. Everybody has to be clear about how it works. No funny business. And it uh, has to be a formula that works. It has to be based on collections. Because if the money is in the bank, the doctor can't pay. But again, I'm in favor of a bonus program that benefits everyone. And, and Kathy, um, what, you, you've seen so many dental officers of her quarter century. Um, what does an average dental office look like as far as number of operatories, dentists, collection, number of hygienists? Versus, like, what is the 10%? What is the attainable? I mean, if someone was to contact you, and you can contact Kathy at jamesonmanagement.com. That's just jameson, J-A-M-E-S-O-N, management.com. Uh, can they email you, Kathy? Yes, absolutely. What, what's your email? Or what would be the email? Well, the best would probably be info, I-N-F-O, at jamesonmanagement.com. Is it, is it realistic if someone said, well, this is what the average dental office does, and I want to be in the top 10%? I mean... I mean, everybody can't be in the top 10%. I mean, someone's got to be, you know, the 50%. But, but what, what, what is, um, what is a reasonable expectation of where the average client is, where they, when they call you, and what is achievable down the road five, ten years if they committed to success? Are you talking about in terms of productivity? Well, you know, productivity, number of operatories, like, like when you talk about a hygiene department, should every dentist have two? Should they all be shooting for three? Um, should, it, it is a five operatory office all you need? Do you need six chairs, seven chairs? Because you know what 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 is what is the, is the top ten percent as I, far as I, I I love a practice, and this is going to sound very conservative, but I love and I'm going to give you a caveat around that. I love a practice that has four treatment rooms, two hygienists and a doctor with two assistants. Now I'm talking about that's a solo practice. So that's so that's six ops, that's, two that's, two no, two hygienists. Four. Two, two hygienists, two ops for the dentist, working with two assistants in those two ops. Okay, just, so just four ops. Yeah, you, you, I can, we, can, we can have a multi-million dollar practice in a practice like that. Now, if you're moving into more dentists, uh, every dentist needs at least two treatment rooms. And then if you're going to have two dentists in the practice, I want to maximize how much hygiene, hygiene, hygienists that that state will allow. So in the state of Oklahoma, let's say, if we had two dentists in our practice, I would want four treatment rooms for those dentists, two per doctor, each doctor with two assistants, so we can do expanded functions to the, to the degree that the state will allow. And then I want each dentist to have two hygienists. So and then as it, grow, as it goes bigger and bigger, it would expand in that way. Um, with the, with the, the vast entrance and the vast influx of managed care, you know, a lot of doctors are doing more treatment rooms and seeing more patients because of the lower fees. Obviously, increase in volume is, or the reduced fees is indicating a need to increase the volume. And so we're seeing doctors, um, you know, seeing, doing more treatment rooms and seeing more patients. In certain states, where there's a, there truly is expanded functions, we have EFTAs, it's great in my opinion, because then you can certainly follow this rule of thumb. You want to delegate everything you possibly can to any, anyone who is qualified or certified according to the laws of the state. We want the dentist to do the things that only a dentist can do. So I feel like as the managed care continues to evolve, the states will be, hopefully, it is my hope, that more states will become actively involved in providing good quality certified expanded functions, capabilities, and, and, and the certifications. So I want to ask you a very uh, politically incorrect question. Um, the, these kids are coming out of school, you know, three, four hundred thousand dollars in debt. Right. Most of the people giving them a job is in a dental office that's 80 to 85 percent PPOs. Right. 
And then the society is telling them, well, you can't be a good dentist unless you buy a $150,000 CERAC machine, a $100,000 3D uh, CBCT x-ray machine, and a $75,000 laser machine. How do you – I mean, you, you can't have everything. Can you – can you have an 85% PPO practice, have $350,000 student loans, and is it still and, and still think it's a good idea to buy a CIRAC, a CBT, and a laser? What, what do you what do you tell these young kids when their debt sheet is huge and they want to and they want to double their student loan debt? I mean, if you walk out 350 in debt and you turn around and buy a laser, a CBCT, and a CAD CAM, you just doubled your dental school debt Absolutely. in a day. Absolutely. So there's two, two, two um, directions that can go. If a doctor coming out of school is going into a practice, they already has that equipment, they're capable of using it, but they don't have to buy it. So that's good. If they're going into a practice where they're going in as an associate, I mean, as a partner, or going in and buying a practice, which again is not the norm, about 60% about of dentists are going into a corporate environment as they graduate from school. But... <clears throat> They just can't. They have to look at their debt and look at the, their capability of servicing that debt and manage the manage the debt. And hopefully, they get great advice from their accountants or advice so that as any time they buy a piece of equipment or refine their practice or build on or whatever, if they're adding to their debt, they need to know how much is that going to cost additionally per month, and they need to have a plan of action about how they're going to increase their revenues by that much plus. Uh, otherwise, it's going to dip into their own salary and or their capability of servicing debts. So the management of debt at the beginning uh, is going to, number one, make them, have, give them a better credit rating as time evolves and they're ready to buy or practice or whatever it may be. They don't want to mess up their credit rating right off the bat. Actually, John just sent me an article, but I haven't read the whole thing. I just got it this morning from the ADA that rates dentists as one of the three top lending persons uh, because of the high salary that they make and the, and the integrity and their, their willingness and ability to service the debt. It was physicians and dentists and I can't remember the other one, but so dentists are right up there in terms of a desirable person to lend to from the financial entities. But the ADA also tells us that financial stress is the largest detriment to a a dental family marriages of any of the other stresses. So while there's a desire to get all the big, new, beautiful equipment, and that does help people do great dentistry, I love all of it, it has to come in a time when the increased productivity can service the debt without that taking away from the doctor's ability to either service debts and or take home money for home. Now the debts the kids are coming out of school with are just huge. And uh, it's frightening. It's frightening to them. Kathy, you are uh, you. You've had um, huge books in dentistry over the years. You, uh, uh, you your book uh, Success Strategies for the Aesthetic Dental Practice was an international bestseller forever. Um, you got a new book, Creating a Healthy Work Environment, uh, based on your uh, doctoral work in leadership. Uh, there it is, right there. Um, ha, ha, where do where do you order these books? On your website? On Amazon? Where where, where do you recommend? Get it right from us. Uh, it At will jamesonmanagement.com? Jamesonmanagement.com. And you can go to our website, and we have, a, we have a, a catalog right there online. So if you go to jamesonmanagement.com, they can order the book there. And uh, you know, Howard, I'm very proud of this book, and I appreciate you and, and reading it already. I appreciate that. This is an accumulation of my experience over 25 years, and it's, it's the doctoral work. And it's called Creating a Healthy Work Environment because it, it's all about the leadership principles that I truly believe are instrumental in helping people enjoy their work, to find fulfillment in the profession, to not burn out, to really nurture their team members, to be happy with the people that they work with, and, and to make a lot of money. Uh, all, all that makes sense. That's not necessarily the norm out there. Uh, one thing I'd like to go back to Howard and this relates to the book as well this is all about I have a section on hiring I have a section on, on orientation and, and integration of new people and then how to nurture those relationships and if then I also have a section in there on if there are problems between team members or between the doctor and team member team member or whatever how do you handle those conflicts in a constructive way 
And so, uh, you know, I believe most, most situations can be resolved. We've just never been taught how to do that. So again, if I've got somebody on my team that I really like, I really care about, I really believe has talent and capability, I want to nurture that relationship. Does that mean we're never going to have problems? Absolutely not. We're human beings. If we have problems, I want to learn how to address that and solve it and be stronger on the other side. But sometimes, if that isn't resolvable, then one of the best things that dentists will do, one of the hardest things any owner, any business will ever do, is let someone go. Um, we take a long time to do that. Sometimes we take too long to do that. But it can be one of the best things that can ever happen for the growth and the health of a business. So all of this is included in the book. It's all oriented towards it's and what, specific, actually. And, and what makes me so frustrated is I, I think of the thousands of hours I spent studying calculus and physics and the periodic table and never have used it for one minute my entire life. Right. And everything I needed to know, like what you're talking about, I, I want you to address this. Um, you know, we're we're coming up on the Super Bowl, and uh, and you know, I, I look at those industries where they have three or four full-time employees, scouts, and when they're trying to feel like a quarterback, they have a complete list of every single player that ever played in college, and I mean, they they take it, they take HR hiring just seriouser than as we do the election and then the dentist needs an assistant he runs an ad on craigslist two people drop a resume off and he hires one of them i mean i've always thought that they just don't take hr serious i mean i mean it's like if, if they need if the if the assistant quit or, or gave two weeks notice they're like well i, I gotta fill this right now and and I, I ran an ad on craigslist and i got two people and i need someone to start next tuesday and so you're it and what 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 do you, what do you, how what would how would you grade HR in dentistry? Um, is pathetic an appropriate word? <laughs> yeah. It's just pathetic. Now, are there people out there that can help? Are there entities that do practice good HR? Absolutely. So while I say that, is it 100 percent universal? No. There are great. There are great companies in dentistry that do provide HR guidance. Howard, most people, when we first start working with them, don't even have a personal policy manual. Or I'll say, do you have a personal policy manual? They'll say, you know what? I, I think we did that once. Let me go see if I can dig this out from some box in the attic. It's unbelievable to me. Do they have personnel files? No. Are there other people read the personnel policy manual? No. Do they even know what the benefits are? No. And then the issue about how do you handle different situations? There's no rhyme or reason why or how things are handled. So they, people get into a mess. And then this whole thing, as I've mentioned several times, is a whole critical factor of hiring. I know that you've read Jim Collins' work in Good to Great. Well, you know, his research of 20 PhD researchers over a long period of time, um, you know, they, they were studying four to 500 companies, and they wanted to know what makes these companies tick. They found that about 11 of those four to 500 companies went from what they called measurably good to measurably great. Well, a lot did, but only 11 held that there. And some of that's changed over time, but at that time of the study, that was the way it was. And they said, oh, well, we thought they had to have a new strategic plan, a new vision. And they said that was not what happened at all. And here's a quote from Mr. Collins' book. He said what they did, these companies, is they got the right people on the bus. That's his quote. They got the wrong people off the bus, and they got the right people on the right seats. And I would add, as a management person, they had the right people in the right seats doing the right things in the right way. And... Uh, so I want people to hire slow and hire right. The cost emotionally and financially of not having the right people in, in place is horrific. And that's what causes people to throw up. You're exactly right. So uh, the time, money, energy, effort to get the HR correct and to stay on top of that and to have a resource to go to anytime there's questions or issues can not only help people in a legal way, but also can cause, can save a lot of problems down the, down the road. Okay, so Kathy, I'm, I'm gonna pick you, ask you this, because you're perfect for it, because you're not from Beverly Hills or Manhattan, you're from Davis, Oklahoma. Half the dentists in America are rural, 
and they always say, well, you don't, you don't get it. I'm, I'm in a town of 5,000. There's a, there was only one dental assistant in my town who currently lived in my town uh, that, um, that, you know, that, that was available for a job. You know, it's not like Howard, you're in Phoenix. You know, you got, you got 3 million people. What, what do you tell people in rural areas that say, well, the reason my assistant and receptionist is, are not quite right in the head is because I only had a small town of 5,000 to pick from. What, what, what do you say to that? Uh, John practiced in a town of 2,000 people. We had brick streets and one stoplight that really didn't even work. So what we did, Howard, is, is we didn't have anybody who had dental experience at all in our community. There was 12 dentists in a 12-mile radius of about 12,000 people. So there was really not, we didn't have a pool of, of dental tra- Hygienists obviously had to be licensed, and we were fortunate to have great hygienists that came and worked with us. But um, for assistants and business administrators, we, get, we identified what kind of a person do we want on this team, what characteristics, what kind of attitude, what kind of skills do we want them to have, and we would hire that person and then took it upon ourselves to train them we, and you know, give them the education they needed, get them certified in everything we could certify those clinical assistants in in the state of Oklahoma, and we paid for it. We did whatever it took to get them certified, uh, nurtured them, built them, taught them. We, we were continuously educating, and those people were stars, stars, and stayed with John for years and years and years. And uh, over his entire career, practicing 30 years, he only had five assistants total. And I, and I always notice this also to those rural dentists. I, I've seen so many people that you hired, and because she's got 10 years' experience uh, at a dental office, and she's been on Dentrix the whole time. And I walk up there and say, how many reports does uh, Dentrix have? Does it have 5, 10, 50, 100? She has no idea. And then then I go hire um, someone off the street who was a bookkeeper or who I stole from the desk at a Chase Bank. And I put them in your office. And at the end of the week, they know all those answers. The best one one of the (laughs) administrators we ever had was a legal secretary. And her attorney, who was a good friend of John's in another town, he was not going to practice anymore for various reasons. And so John went to him and said, Pat is great, but she's wasting away here. She's got so much talent, so much ability, so much energy. Can I bring her in can i hire her for my practice if she wants to and he said yes and we worked it out and she worked with us and you're right she she learned whatever she needed to learn and she put her up time energy effort you're right there are so many people that in your dentist example is classic they don't even have the initiative to pick up the book and learn or pick up the phone and call the trainers i'm like you're on dentrix and you don't can't even tell me how to run an age accounts receivable report Stop it, people. How can you run a business without the people in your business office knowing how to use your, your computer software? It's nuts. It's nuts. So, so you're also known, um, um, you know, I, I know a lot of people that use you for marketing. Uh, yes. When, and when you think of marketing, the first question I always wonder is, you know, when you say to Dennis, what do you think the best marketing is? They're always going to say something like Facebook, Twitter, um, I'm old school. I I always think the best marketing is on your existing patients. I mean, there's 7 billion people on earth. I'd rather focus on the the thousand who who I've met over the last 28 years who aren't in my office than some guy in, you know, uh, um, Cambodia. Uh, When when you think of marketing, do you think of uh, internal marketing to, to existing patients or do you think of external marketing, billboards, radio, TV, Facebook? We would classify that as external. We, we want a 70-30 split, Howard, and, and we really, I, again, I, I, I bought and integrated a marketing company in the, in the Jameson management about 12 what, years. What's the, what's the 70, external or internal? The 70, 70 is internal, the 30 is external. And so I, I just bow to these marketing experts, they're awesome. They understand the connection between marketing and management, that these are not two separate entities, that these two have to fold in. What I mean by that is, so somebody goes out and spends a bazillion dollars on marketing and they generate bazillion new patients. But if those new patients are coming into practice, imagine this is a funnel, coming into practice as a new patient, but they're falling out the bottom as fast as they're coming in the top, so what? It's like a vicious cycle and it wears people out and it's, it's a waste of time and energy. So I want people to come in into the practice as a new patient, receive a good new patient experience, and then say yes to treatment and stay there. In fact, here's the cycle we want. We want to market well enough that we have the 
appropriate number of, of new patients for that practice. We want them to say yes to treatment in healthy numbers, 80% or more, 75, 80% or more is even better. We want them to schedule the appointment and keep it because they believe in what they're getting ready to get to receive. They're going to pay for the dentistry willingly. I'm not going to say happily, but willingly. They're going to stay actively involved with us in hygiene, and they're going to refer. And that six-step cycle, if a doctor has the vision that every single person that we attract to our practice, we're going to fit into that six-step cycle. Ken Blanchard called that the raving fan. The person who comes to you says yes to treat treatment, schedules and keeps it, pays for it willingly, stays actively involved in hygiene, and refers. So we want about 70% of all marketing efforts to be internal. And, yeah, and again, it's, it's nurturing that which you already have, and that's your existing patient family, and then getting referrals from those people that have had a great experience with you. I think that will always be the number one source of new patients. About 30% others. Social media is huge. We want a very strong, excellent social media presence. And also the website. The website is where a lot of people are going to seek either a new dentist or seek information about a dentist they know about or their own dentist. And so not only having a great, interactive, beautiful website where that someone who knows what they're doing has, has developed, but also having strong SEO, search engine optimization, where they are constantly evolving that and making sure that when, when people are going in and looking, that doctor's name is going to come up on that first page. And so they have to have the right hit words and et cetera, et cetera. But also that website needs to be evolving so that people have a reason to go back and revisit it, and they need to be encouraging their patient family to go back and revisit. So through your social media, you can encourage people to go to the website, but they're not going to go to the website unless there's ever-changing, ever-evolving, new and exciting information there. And then there are companies that can do that for a doctor. A doctor may say, oh, I don't have time to do that. Well, that may be true. Then they need to seek experts to help them with that. Uh, so we, again, yes, social media is here. It, it, it needs a strong presence, but there's nothing that will ever take the place of a of personal referral. However, it and so going back to that, they're going to make sure, I challenge doctors to do this, sit down as a team and go through your entire new patient experience or any patient visit, any patient visit, I don't care what kind of patient visit, and ask yourselves what happens from the minute somebody picks up the phone to the time they come in to the time they da 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 Listen to and look at and experience everything that that patient experiences and ask yourself what is really going well and keep doing more of that. And then ask themselves the more productive question, and that is, how can we do everything that we're doing a little bit better and stay on that cutting edge? Um, my, my, my problem, um, when, I, when I look at the consulting industry, I, I think the number one problem is all the really successful dentists like myself, we've always used consultants for 25 years, and we're trying to get from a million to two million to three million. And then I look at all the people that are just drowning and where you could just be a life changer, and they never raise their hand and get help. So I look at the consultants as they always help the people who need the least amount of help because that's why they're successful. They always got their hand up because they know if they give Kathy a dollar, they're going to make the dollar back in at least 50 cents. And then the person drowns. So what I want you to do this, you're talking to several thousand dentists right now. Um, I want you to tell them that what you like to fix, how much is it? Like, what are you good at? I want you to paint pictures of these thousands of listeners. They're all commuting to work where you sit there and say, say you know, if this is your problem, you know, give me this much money. I'll do this. What, what, what do you like to fix? What's your ideal dentist client problem what what's Kathy the best at fixing it's a good question and let me go back and, and, and segue into a question you asked me earlier that I didn't quite answer and that was how much can a doctor expect as a return on investment from consulting our average increase in productivity is 35 percent within the first year to a year and a half after a doctor um, works with us so uh, you know for the practice is doing a million yeah but, but 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 the problem with that is the guys calling you they're already doing a million and they're going to a million three hundred, but the idiot doing three hundred thinks he can't afford you. Exactly. I, I just I just talked to a young doctor. He's like forty, and um, he's producing. He's in a nice area. He's producing. He's been practicing for ten years. He's producing forty thousand dollars a month. 
I'm like, $40,000 a month? That doesn't even pay your bills. And so, uh, but yet he doesn't feel like he can afford to consult. So Howard, the first thing I would, the third, first thing we do is we work with the doctor. One of the first things we do right out of the shoot is work with the doctor on leadership. Because we know, again, as I said at the outset, that if the doctor doesn't understand his or her role in leadership, the consultation experience isn't going to work as well as it can. So then we're going to start digging into, we're going to evaluate the practice. And we're going to start with the area that needs the most attention. So let's say a practice that, that I had a little bit of input with not too long ago in, in Manhattan. Their schedule was, they didn't, they didn't have a scheduling system, so we started right there with scheduling. They don't have an insurance system in place, and they're 90% PPO. And I said, she was losing more money per month than she was producing. So we had to dig in immediately and get that insurance system set up and her people trained on how to administer that, ins that, that insurance. So I think in answer to your question, we try to individualize what we work on based on the immediate needs of the practice and whatever's going to make the most profound difference for the practice most more quickly. So that it is going to be a combination of the systems. Usually the systems that need the biggest issue are scheduling, financing, big issue, always a big issue, insurance management, huge issue, growing is an issue. Uh, once we get some of those business systems in place, we want to move into to hygiene rapidly and get the hygiene, the management of the hygiene system going well, as well as building the non-surgical perio. And throughout every single consult, we want to work with every single person on the team on helping more people say yes to the treatment that the doctor is recommending and get some of that dentistry out of the charts into the mouths of the patients. So again, the no no consultation that we do is exactly like any other consultation because we have to know who you are, what you want, what your goals are, what your areas of need are, and based on our evaluation also, we're going to come to an agreement on a plan of action that's going to generate substantial money for you rapidly. Most doctors, in fact, another doctor I talked to this week is producing every two months he's producing more money, more additional money than he invested in his entire consult with us. And what, what, and how much does this cost a month? Or how, how, how much is, do you charge? We, his, his monthly fee was 3300 a month, and he's producing $15,000 more per month than when we is, is that, Does everybody pay the same fee, or is it different, or is it depending on the size of the practice? Or? What he received was the two-day leader conference, which I teach, monthly support, monthly coaching calls with he and his team via GoToMeeting or Skype. Then we, for him, we did six days of in-office coaching where we actually fly to his practice, work with him, his team, his patients, his facility. Some doctors do two days a quarter. He did six. He did six days plus the leadership. Uh, so the, the number of days we work in a practice determines the total investment. Some will be more, some will be less. And then he was a solo practice, so that fee was what he paid for a solo doctor doing six days in office consulting. And, and what, I, what I want to tell you, homies, is that in, in a small dental cottage industry where every – I mean, hey, Dental Town, the website has 210,000 members. I mean, you can't survive in this industry for 25 years unless you're doing something productive and helping people. I mean, if every client Kathy had lost money, she would have gone bankrupt 24 years ago. And, and, and I just can't stress enough that to take one of my buddies, uh, Jerome Smith, I, I don't know of an office better than that. And he's had 10 different consultants in the last 20 years. Be, and, and that's how they get to a perfect, perfect office. They always are humble. They always have their hand up and they always know a consultant is a return on investment. I, I don't think I've ever had a consultant where I didn't learn a major pearl that paid for itself threefold, and my 28-year journey is just this, 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 all kinds of consultants. Um, uh, so, Kathy, I just want to say uh, um, I think you're the luckiest woman in the world because the coolest dentist I've ever met on life uh, was your husband, John. He has got to be the coolest good old boy dentist from Oklahoma. And that's where Brad Pitt's from too, isn't he? Brad Pitt's from Shawnee, Oklahoma, isn't he? You know, I, I'm embarrassed. I can't tell you that I don't know. Yeah, yeah, Brad Pitt. And and, and it's funny because I met his uh, dental office that, that used to work with him. They said he was also the best good old boy 
just the best good old Oklahoma boy they'd ever met. But yeah. your husband, he's got to be, he just got to be the greatest guy in the world. I have to agree. Howard, he's the nicest human being I've ever known. He's nice to all people, all the time, no matter what. And, and I'd like to get him on a podcast. You think he'd ever do this? Oh, yes, he would do that. And he, you'd have so much fun. Tell him it'd be the first time we ever talked for an hour where we weren't sitting at a bar having a beer. <laughs> maybe maybe we'll just each drink a beer on Skype together. We'll just. Well, I mean, nobody would care. You might as well. He is. He just. And, and what I like, I don't know if it's because I'm from Kansas or whatever, but um, I just always feel like the consultants, like you guys in the Midwest, you just you just keep it real. It's real advice that works, and it doesn't matter where you are. Is where some business models only work in Beverly Hills and Manhattan and Key Biscayne, and I think 90% of America is more. Um, like, like, like how you do it. You know what I mean? And I think, Howard, the fact that we did it, we built the practice together, we figured out those systems together, we have had the high roads and the low roads, and we've, we've learned how to work through those. So the practicality of the, of the management reflects the fact that it's not theory, although I've done a lot of research and a lot of study. It's based on being in the trenches and doing it every day for 30 years. So how much does your book cost on jamesonmanagement.com? And should they get the new one, Creating a Healthy Work Environment? Or should they also get the, um, the, the last one, Success Strategies for the Aesthetic Dental Practice? Okay, well, the Success Strategies, if somebody buys that book, which is published by Quintessence, I'm very proud of that, it is a textbook on how to manage a practice. And it's got the majority. It's got the major systems of dental practice lined out so if somebody reads that and studies that as a team, it's even got how-tos at the end of every chapter. If they read that book and put it into action, it, it, it's worth millions, I'm, I promise you. So there's the practicality of that. The creating a healthy work environment is leadership, teamwork, how to function more effectively as people really striving to build a great practice. So it depends. Buy them both. Buy them both. And I'm just curious, did you uh, renew John's lease for 2016? Are you going to keep him another year? You know what? I am going to keep him for another year. All right. Tell him he's a lucky man. <laughs> Kathy, thank you so much for spending an hour with me today. What a joy. I loved it. All right. Thanks, buddy.